I now look to Catherine Parsons to close the, ca to close the case for the opposition. Thank you so much. Um, I just very inspired by the speakers on the floor, um, especially this phrase, finding the artifacts of dead empires in the Computer Science Museum in San Francisco. Rory, were you, were you there? I was, yeah, yeah, yes. thank you very much. I mean, we have some digital dinosaurs over here, don't we? You know, like, I don't know whether it was the story about Apple or the story about the condoms, but Rory, honestly, um, you know, the world has changed. Um, society has changed. And we are all digital citizens. We are part of that technology society. And, you know, these young human beings, Rory, are actually a different species to you. Um, everyone here grew up with smartphones. You know, yes, you didn't go to the launch and see, you know, Steve Jobs hand out the apple, but this has actually shaped who we are as human beings. It's shaped the way that we communicate. It shapes the way that we trade. It shapes the way that we breed, even. Um, I was reading a report recently that shows that apps like Tinder are actually accelerating the cross-pollinations and diversity of societies in ways previously unimaginable. I mean, this is incredible, isn't it? Um, you are highly evolved. We should be very afraid being in front of you right here because you know more and you are more at one with this world than anyone over the age of 35 in this room. They do not qualify as millennials. But I don't like that word millennial because you, know, you kind of think of someone on Snapchat and Tinder and stuff like that. Actually, this is a highly evolved person. You are part of the connected world. And now over 90% of the world of humanity is connected. That's incredible. And I really want to kind of put that in context, because we can laugh about technology, but if you sapien style, think about the history of humanity. This is one of the most seismic moments and shifts in humanity that's ever happened. You know, we are putting simple yet powerful tools in the hands of every human being that allow them to communicate ideas, creativity, collaboration in new ways. So let's go back, let's think about those moments in time. It's been like fire. It's been the invention of language, what I'm doing right now, hopefully. It's been writing, codes, communicating, right through to the printing press, the World Wide Web, smartphones, code, AI. We are living in the new renaissance. And we are so lucky, and I am so excited and feel so privileged to be a part of it. And, uh, to kind of recreate one of my favourite films that maybe inspired me to get into technology. We have a choice. You in this room have a choice that you can make. You can take the blue pill, <laughs> <laughs> or you can take, is it the red pill? <laughs> Does anyone remember which one took him into the matrix? Well, I'm gonna go for the blue one. So, I wanna take the blue pill. What happens when you take the blue pill? The blue pill is saying, yes, I'm going to be a part of this revolution. I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm not going to be threatened. The threatened people take the red pill. So the world of the blue pill this week has been things like DeepMind, um, wait, DeepMind collaborating with the NHS to, sort, to harness the power of artificial intelligence to potentially create predictive you know, medicine, personalised medicine. They are taking on you know, some of the biggest curing disease. How about a drone in Australia saved two swimmers from drowning? In something like under a minute, it flew out and it threw down um, some rafts of people down there. Driverless cars, this is a reality now. On the streets in America, a town, uh, a retirement village in America this week um, has piloted its driverless vehicles. Now, this is about ageing societies, mobility. The number one cause of death for the age of people in this room are car accidents. And we're not even talking about, you know, injuring yourself. A 26-year-old female entrepreneur I know founded a company called Open Bionics, open sourcing um, data that allows people to 3D print prosthetics. One in a thousand people need prosthetic limbs, and there are currently only two versions they can use. That is unacceptable. And what about Neuralink? 
Elon Musk's latest startup, he's put about 30 million into it. This is about inserting a bit of artificial intelligence, neural lace into your brain. I quite like this stuff. I know it can be a bit scary, but I mean, essentially, this is the next frontier of being human. This is about the next level of connectedness, not just being connected through those smartphone devices, it's putting it inside of us. We really are living at an extraordinary moment in time. You can be afraid of it, or you can be part of it. You can be excited by it. Take the blue pill. Don't get them confused. Um, <laughs> harness the power. You know, harness the power of artificial intelligence, and you can be solving some of the biggest problems in the world right now. And this is all being kind of galvanised at the moment in the industrial strategy, the grand challenges. But that's, you know, how can we actually use the power of artificial intelligence to solve problems like pollution, disease, inequality? A book that's coming out next year is showing data that AI is more effective than HR departments, predominantly female HR departments, at eking out inequality when it comes to allowing applicants for those roles. I mean, that's phenomenal. This is an amazing moment in time. So what's the problem? It's all moving a bit fast, isn't it? It feels a bit overwhelming. Those examples that I just gave you, things that have literally happened in the last year. And we can be very complacent about it. But we're living in a renaissance. It's very hard. You go back 100 years, it's been quite a while since the pace of innovation has been happening like this. We should not be overwhelmed. We shouldn't be blasé about it. We should be in absolute awe of the pace and speed of change and innovation. But Thomas Friedman's book, Thank You For Being Late, had a very simple chart that show technology's pace of innovation going like that, and how human beings change and evolve, we're a bit like that. So we don't like change. Human beings hate change, and we are very bad at changing. Now, um, who was it who said that you need 10,000 hours to become an expert at something? I mean, really, one of my passions in life is accelerated learning. You know, I wanted to kind of teach anyone how to code in a day. I didn't have three years to go back to university. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the time. But we need to learn. We need to learn fast. We need to change fast. Now, everyone in this room, I believe that you can do that. But we need to think about what do we really need to be afraid of here? It's the people who are going to be left behind. So the Oxford Martin Institute predicted that up to 50% of people are going to have their jobs replaced by machines in the next 10 years. They're going to get left behind. Who are they? The truck drivers, the admin workers? But it's more than that. Some people think it's going to be the lawyers, the doctors, the bankers. But really, it's people at the front line. And what happens when those people suddenly don't have jobs? Lots of unemployment. Civil, civil riots, you know, and also more than that, people losing their, their sense of meaning, their sense of purpose in life. But there's another group of people who are worried that they're going to be left behind, and it's the leaders. It's the leaders, it's the C-suite, it's the people in government, it's the people supposed to be creating the legislation. They feel they're being left behind by the pace of change. And I know because we travelled the world in the last year teaching them code, data, AI. But what happens when they don't learn? Fear, paralysis, and actually wanting to legislate against all this magnificent change. They're doing it because they're scared of it. They're doing it because they don't understand it. So what happens then when you take the red pill? Well, when you take the red pill, I think you just stop evolving and you die. <laughs> Don't take the red pill. Um, now, I was thinking, I was having a conversation earlier today, and I was thinking, what would Leonardo da Vinci have done? So let's go back to the Renaissance. I think Leonardo da Vinci would have taken the blue pill. He is curious, creative, a problem solver. He was a vegetarian. Did anyone know that? He was famous for being a vegetarian. So basically, he was a bit of a hipster, right? <laughs> so if Leonardo da Vinci existed today, he would be a coder. And he'd be a hipster coder. <laughs> so I am not afraid of the technology empires, not at all. I am actually afraid of the 99.9% .9 of people 
who feel like they are not part of the technology renaissance that is happening. Because either they don't know how to code, they don't know what code is, um, they're scared of the algorithms, they're scared of change, and I want everyone to be a part of that revolution. So please, vote with us, don't be afraid, take the blue pill, um, and vote for the opposition. Thank you.